We are going to start our discussion of integrated pest management with a simple overview of some of the concepts and just a general explanation of what the term is referring to and how we can think about this process of dealing with pests in the landscape. We will get very technical as we continue on, but I wanna start with a general overview so that we can all sort of be at the same place at the same time. So here we go with our first introductory lecture. This is just an introduction to the concept of integrated pest management. And notice the title photo here. We've got a ladybug, ladybird beetle, uh, going after a food source, which appeared to be some type of aphid. And so we've got the predator and we've got the prey. And uh, then of course we have our plant. This is kind of an ecological approach that we're gonna carry through our entire course as we discuss integrated pest management. So we're gonna start off with IPM as an acronym. You'll hear people refer to IPM. It's what we commonly say is a shortcut for integrated pest management. And just make sure, of course, you know that uh, when you hear IPM, what it means, what it stands for, integrated pest management. It's a relatively new concept in the horticultural trade and kind of the landscape profession, but it uh, originates from agriculture. And it's really looking at how to do uh, pest control in a more ecologically sound fashion. It's a great term because uh, it has a lot involved with it. So let's kind of just break it down a little bit here. Integrated, it's the first word in the term. It basically means if something is integrated, you've brought all the parts together. And so uh, that's what we're doing here. We're bringing together multiple strategies, multiple different solutions that have been successful in different capacities. We're bringing them all together to consider uh, a possible solution to a problem. Now, pest is an interesting term in and of itself. Nobody likes to be called a pest, but uh, we, we call any living organism a pest if it is harmful to humans or to human concerns, like growing a garden, growing food, uh, a nursery crop, something like that. Anything that's going to harm either people or the things we need and we're concerned about, we call that a pest. This could also be now referred to as uh, a pest of an ecosystem. If we're trying to protect or preserve a local habitat, uh, we can think of pests that may not be naturally accustomed to the area. So uh, we're, we're dealing with a problem. The problem is we've got some kind of pest that is causing harm to people or causing harm to something that people care about. And if we don't do anything, it's gonna continue to cause harm. We've gotta do something to try to stop the harm from happening. And uh, how are we gonna approach it? We're gonna approach it with an integrated approach. We're going to bring many different ideas, strategies, potential solutions to the table. And finally, it brings us to the M in IPM, this concept of management. And management in this uh, regard is dealing, it's a process for dealing with or controlling something. Again, it's the idea that if we don't do anything, uh, or at least if we don't pay attention to it, it can continue to cause harm and so we're in a situation where we've got to make a decision. Do we do something? If we do something, how do we do it in a way that's the most beneficial? So IPM is an approach to controlling or treating a situation with pests and trying to prevent the pests from continuing to cause harm or damage to something that we're concerned about, in this case, growing plants. And it could be growing plants for any number of reasons. 
And how are we going to do that? We're going to think critically and we're going to consider a variety of possible solutions. We're going to have a hierarchy of solutions and a tool to help you decide what is the best thing to do. And that is the integrated pest management approach. So from here on out, I just have a few kind of general photos to share and we'll talk about each one and how it kind of relates to the IPM philosophy. But uh, some people struggle with the concept of uh, doing anything at all. You might say, well, you know, gardens, they're about nature and nature is about just letting nature take its course. Uh, don't get involved. Humans can only do bad if we get involved. There is some very important truth to consider with that approach. However, we also recognize that when we grow plants, it is not always a natural thing. So for instance, the image that you see here, a very formal garden, obviously takes a lot of effort to keep it looking this way. And this is something that's mainly just for aesthetic beauty. But uh, if you wanna keep it this way, you're going to have to input energy. And if you input energy, uh, it's either in the form of a lawnmower or somebody coming out here and pulling the weeds. Yes, weeds are pests. We're not just talking about bugs or animals. But in general, when we talk about gardens or landscapes, we're thinking about them as kind of human-made or at least human-influenced ecosystems. And so now that you've kind of stepped into the role of a participant in nature, uh, you get to take on a little bit of responsibility to do the right thing and the responsibility to not do the wrong thing. So you've got to do something. You're no longer passive because we are involved in horticulture in growing plants for a specific purpose. We can compare and contrast this to a true wild ecosystem. So here's an image of our local native chaparral. And when you look out, you can see, well, it's pretty, uh, pretty solid, pretty clean looking. There's not a whole lot of problems we can identify. We have vegetative cover across the landscape. But in general, a wild ecosystem, you don't get in there, you don't worry about uh, native bugs eating the plants. In fact, you want that. That's a good thing. That's the plants become the foundation of an ecosystem. They are the only thing that can take the energy from the sun, convert it into chemical energy, uh, and then that becomes the food source for all other living things, both in the soil and above ground. And so we want this. This is important. It's important to human health. It is an important human concern that we keep our wild ecosystems intact. But we're not going to get out there and worry about the individual plant. A plant here or there may catch a disease, may die. Things are going to be always cycling, living and dying. And a healthy cycle is a good thing. That may not be the case in a landscape where if you're trying to, say, grow an apple tree, you don't want your apple tree to live and die and you have to replace it all the time because that is important for you to get the food from. So the idea is uh, some parts of horticulture are a little more hands off. Some parts are much more hands on. It's all about what concern are we trying to address? What is the goal? And even in a landscape like this, we could have an introduction of a pest that is not from this area, not accustomed to, not adapted to this habitat. And it has the potential to get out of control and to cause an excessive amount of harm that would be a problem for us. So even in wild ecosystems, we may come to a point when we decide we must do something. We must intervene. And when we do so, we want to do so with the minimum harm, the maximum benefit. That's what IPM is all about. A lot of times when we're dealing with ornamental horticulture and looking at 
turf grass in particular, that's where we really get into the pesticide application. You can think of a lawn like a farm. It's a monoculture. You're trying to grow one thing and you are competing with the environmental forces that are trying to grow many things. And in some places, like in San Diego, a lawn is not really very natural. We don't experience uh, green grass too often in our chaparral dominant ecosystem. We've got some prairies and we've got some other uh, situations where you get some grasses, but uh, in general, this is a very unnatural situation. The more unnatural it is, the more you need to get in there and intervene. For example, uh, you have to mow the lawn. You have to keep the grass low. Normally, animals would do that, grazing animals, including things like rabbits and deer and all that kind of stuff. But uh, many people would consider the rabbit to be a pest because the rabbit can come in, eat the grass, eat the grass too much, and now the lawn suffers. So we're always trying to kind of freeze a landscape in a moment of time. When we do that, we are forced to come in and do management. I'm not saying lawns are always good. Lawns are always bad. That's not the point of this conversation. But the point is just to recognize the further we stray from a natural type of ecosystem, the more intervention it will require to keep it that way. Similarly, when we grow food in a vegetable garden, that is typically quite an unnatural situation. Most of the food we consider to be you know, vegetables comes from kind of a riparian habitat in nature, a place that is always uh, wet, a lot of flooding with rich soil deposition and regular, uh, sometimes periodic water. And so when you have a vegetable garden, you have to water it frequently. And you're going to have plants, first of all, that are delicious. That's the point. They've been selected to be very delicious. And they're delicious for you and they're delicious for other living things. So if you want to grow a garden, a vegetable garden, and not have any uh, pest management at all, you're welcome to do so. You will get a lot less food. Uh, other things will eat the food. And if that's not your worry, then don't worry about it. But if you're in a business or if you're in a circumstance where the food you produce is necessary, uh, you have a choice to make. You either prevent the pests or you deal with the pests uh, in order to get the food or you lose the food. Uh, here's what a vegetable garden will do if you don't do anything. Here's one possible outcome. We see uh, the evidence of insect pests. Uh, could be insect, could be another type of arthropod or an invertebrate. But uh, basically, it's a bug chewing on the leaf. When we approach a situation like this, you may have tried to plant a garden yourself. You may have found, oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to come out and plant the garden do all this work and effort, and you come back uh, maybe even a week or two later, you're watching it, it looks great, it's growing, and all of a sudden, the next morning you wake up and you look at your plants and someone came through in the night and just obliterated your plants, and now you have a problem. If you're going to do something in this scenario, you need to do so with uh, proper care and consideration. We need to look at the evidence that we see. We need to make a decision. What exactly is the thing that is causing us harm? Uh, identify the organism. Can we find an example? Can we see the, the bug, the perpetrator? Or can we see the evidence of that bug? Does it leave behind droppings or eggs? And then finally, can we look at the damage itself and use that to identify what is causing the harm? So if the first step, we investigate. And then now, now that we get an answer, we make a decision. How much damage is too bad? So do we, do we accept this? It could be that this is not a problem. Uh, say you're growing beets 
those are the root uh, basically of the plant, you can accept a little bit of damage up on the leaves because you're not really concerned. But what if it's a salad crop and you really need the leaves to either be presentable for the public, you're gonna sell them, or even for yourself, you're gonna consume them. So we make a decision, how much damage is acceptable? And once we reach an unacceptable amount, then we do some kind of control in order to bring it back into an acceptable range. And it's not just bugs we're talking about when we're growing our crops. When you are planting a garden, for example, we are making sure that we have a healthy plant. And in our ecosystem, plants are the producers and there's a whole bunch of consumers, including people. And if we grow a healthy plant, that healthy plant has some ability to resist things eating it, but ultimately it's going to be the food for any number of organisms. And some of those are disease organisms, bacterial, fungal, viral diseases even. And we can debate whether or not a virus is an organism, but ultimately we're looking at the health of our plant as if we are doctors. We're trying to diagnose and prescribe treatments for growing healthy plants. So ultimately the big categories of pests, we have arthropods, which include insects and snails, slugs, and all those sorts of things, things you would call bugs generally. Uh, arthropods, we've got diseases, which include bacteria, fungus, and viral disease. And we've got weeds, which are other plants. Those are plant pests. And so we're thinking about plants, animals, and the, the small little microscopic things. What most people would do is they run out and they grab the spray, 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 spray. And you can imagine all sorts of names. Uh, some are more infamous than others, but uh, people have strong opinions about the spray. Sometimes uh, you love the spray because it works really well. Sometimes you are very opposed to the spray because of all sorts of concerns with human health and environmental health. And other times you may not know. So we're gonna dive into the details regarding chemicals, chemical control of any type of pest and when it may be necessary or important and how it typically is a last resort. There are often much better answers to using chemicals. But if we do use chemicals, uh, are there any times when it's okay, when it's good, when it's maybe the best approach? Uh, that's, an, that's a question we will attempt to endeavor in this class. And if people are using chemicals, how do we make sure that it's safe? Or what are the real risks and hazards? What must be done in order to protect human and other environmental health? We want to think beyond the spray. That is one of the solutions, but we have an integrated approach. We consider all the solutions and we arrive at the appropriate one for each context. Here's some possible damage. You may look at this and say, oh, these uh, juniper trees, they have a pest. Some kind of disease is attacking these trees. But before we even go there, we wanna think, okay, what else could be causing these problems? Could this be a side effect of some other thing? Could it be that uh, there's frost damage? Could it be that there is pesticide drift? So someone was spraying another plant and it some, some defoliant went and got onto your plant. Could it be any number of possible things affecting this plant. And here's another example. We're taking a look at this lawn. We are problem solvers and we're trying to almost be like a crime scene investigator. You, you approach the scene and you say, okay, what's going on here? And you may have your customer saying, I keep having these dead spots in my lawn and it's got to be some kind of fungal disease. And I want to just apply 
some chemicals. Well, that is possible. That could be one of the things we're seeing here, but we wanna look very carefully. Many times, if something is injured or weakened, then it becomes susceptible to disease as well. And so is the disease the initial cause or could we address whatever is weakening the plant, the disease will disappear. In this case, take a look at that shrub next to the lawn. Notice how tightly manicured that shrub is. Somebody walks up to the shrub regularly and trims it. And what happens is they stand right in the spot with the dead grass. So we've got some compaction in the soil. We've got some other issues going on. And there may or may not be uh, diseases affecting the area in question, but we should look at the root cause. How can we prevent this problem from happening? And maybe either change the hardscape so that uh, the person who does the maintenance is not standing on the grass or change the management practice and don't have them trim that shrub so often. Don't keep it in such a tight little compact shape and then you won't have the issues with the grass. Many possible solutions to a problem. The first thing we gotta think about is what is going on here? Now, when we look at a wild ecosystem, that's a little bit different of a perspective. We don't really want to intervene too much. We want to allow nature to take its course. And in fact, uh, many times, for instance, with our local coast live oak trees, they are an important food source for the entire ecosystem. Uh, there can be thousands of different species that are dependent on this oak tree, con living in, consuming, eating it in one way or another. And so a healthy oak tree is important to have, but a dying or sick oak tree is not necessarily a problem. However, if we are in certain areas and now all the oak trees are dying, that's going to be a problem because all the things that need the oak trees are not going to have their food source. So in this circumstance, we have an introduction of a pest, uh, an organism that is eating the oak tree and there's nothing controlling it. There's no local predator. There's nothing that is keeping this organism in a balance with the ecosystem. Uh, it was a human introduction. And so if humans don't do anything, we're gonna lose the oaks, at least for quite a while. And so it's in our best interest for the health of the ecosystem, for the health of all the plants and animals, for ecosystem services, and for human benefit, that we intervene and try and uh, stop this problem pest from hurting all the oak trees. In our local environment, the primary culprit is an introduced uh, beetle that is called the gold spotted oak borer, uh, the GSOB. And what it does is it uh, goes to an oak tree and it lays its eggs inside an oak tree right under the bark. And those little eggs, they hatch into larva, basically little caterpillars, but we call them larva when it's for a beetle. And as those little young beetles are in the larval stage, they are crawling around under the bark of the tree and they eat the cambium layer, which is the living part of the tree trunk. So as the tree grows outward, you know, it puts off those tree rings every year. There's only a thin layer of living plant tissue right there. It's called the cambium layer. And the ecology, the, the nature of these beetles is that their larvae eat that living tissue. What ends up happening is you get enough larvae in a tree and they make these little squiggly paths and they will end up going in a full circle around the tree trunk. 
uh, eating away the tissue. Once you've done that, you've killed the tree. The tree will never recover because it cannot receive the water from the soil up to the leaves and the sugar from the leaves down to the roots. And so we have cut off the circulation of the tree. The tree will die. And in San Diego, this is a rampant problem that uh, we are struggling to address. And so it's important to be able to identify, okay, is this the gold spotted oak borer or is this a different type of oak borer that is not a problem? We look for the characteristic exit hole that is shaped like a D. It has a flat side on one side. You get very specific. These are details that you really, uh, you'll pile on with your knowledge. You can't know everything, but you got to know how to find the answer. We say, okay, we do have the gold spotted oak borer. What can we do about it? It's one of the ones that we don't have very many good solutions right now. It's, if you get into pest management, uh, you can go very far if you wanna address the gold spotted oak borer problem for San Diego. One of the things we can tell people is don't spread their firewood. Don't purchase firewood in one place and then go and uh, burn it in another place. If you go camping or if you go have a party on the beach or something, you want to buy the firewood close to where you burn it. Uh, so we avoid future introductions. And ultimately, if we do nothing, we end up with forests that look like this. And here we've got uh, uh, pine beetle infestation, and there are vast quantities of our forests. The trees are mostly dead. You may say uh, this is not a problem because it's part of nature. Well, if it's preventable, it's in our best interest. Uh, it could be that there's nothing we can do and we must let nature take its course. And who knows, in a thousand years, it may be back to where it was. But uh, the point is, if we have the opportunity to intervene, to manage uh, a landscape, we have to make that decision whether it's worthwhile or not. And if we can do something that is an overall net benefit, oftentimes it is worth our effort to maintain a healthy, intact ecosystem. And that's what we're doing here in this class. Sometimes there's no good answers, but the point of integrated pest management is that we look at all the details. We think of all the solutions, and we think of the entire problem and we come up with an approach that is going to do as much good as we can and minimize the harm. Some of the things I'll introduce in this class are things that we know the right answer to. Here is the best way to deal with this. But oftentimes, in fact, the majority of circumstances, you have many options and it's up to you in that circumstance to look at the clues, look at the context and decide how to approach this problem. It's a fun class because you get to really use some uh, critical thinking, problem solving. You learn a lot about nature. A lot of people think if you're into IPM, you hate bugs, but actually we love bugs. We love to learn about them. We're really interested in the life cycle, the identification, and we have an appreciation for all of nature, for all of life. And so then when we recommend our solutions, we're trying to recommend an approach that is going to allow life to continue to flourish. That's really the whole point of all this. That's really the idea, philosophy and approach behind integrated pest management. In future weeks, we're gonna dive into the details and you will end this course with a greater knowledge and something you can apply right away for approaching any kind of pest problem in your local garden or environment.